Well, 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 I am so delighted to have here my friend Harsh Mariwala, chairman of Marico Limited, a publicly listed company in India. Over the past 30 years, he has transformed a traditional commodity business into a leading consumer products company in the beauty and wellness space. Harsh's passion for innovation has led him to establish Marico Innovation Foundation in 2003, and he spearheads uh, entrepreneurship through various things such as Ascent, a foundation that's peer learning and entrepreneurial platform. He was the EY Entrepreneur of the Year in 2020 for, for India, which is the world's most prestigious business award for entrepreneurs. Harsh, I'm really honored to welcome you to the show, Bold Conscious Connections. Thank you. Thank you, Raju, for inviting me to the show and my pleasure to be with you. Awesome. So, you know, I usually I start with this question, but yeah, so I'm going to put all your honors and your accolades and your accomplishments in the show notes that are going to go with the show. But my audience, which tends to be corporate professionals who've you know decided to become entrepreneurs, but they just haven't found the real confidence to make the jump. But I'd like to t for you to tell them who Harsh Mariwala is beyond what he does. Who is Harsh Mariwala? Well, Harsh Mariwala is a very simple man, you know, <laughs> with simple tastes, very down to earth, very practical, and wanting to add value to others, to make a difference to others' lives. I think at different stages in one's journey, you change. And when I was very young, when I started business, of course, when you're young and you are starting a new business, uh, you want to be successful in the business in terms of the growth, the profitability. So those days, the prime driver was, how can I be more profitable? How can I be more wealthy? But mm -hmm. as you progress in life and as the business settles down and you know, it's on a good wicket, then you start questioning what next? And then, okay, then you say, okay, I want recognition for whatever I've done. I want respect. So that is the second phase in my life, which happened for it. And then again, you start questioning, okay, now all that has happened, so what next? And that's the time you realize that, okay, life is much more than making money or getting respect and recognition. And ultimately, I think you want to give something back and to make a difference. So today, at my age, and my stage in my entrepreneurial journey. I do all that, but the proportion of that is going on changing. You know, initially, as I said, it was more wealth, then respect, recognition, and then making a difference, a purpose in life. So today, I'm not saying that wealth is not important or recognition not important, but mm -hmm. substantial part of my journey today goes after making a difference, a difference to others in whatever way I can. When I have to be a capitalist and making a difference. I don't want to make a difference by donating money to some college or some school or hospital. But mm -hmm. my way of making a difference is what I call activity. Even if I support somebody, I have to be actively involved. Actively involved in terms of making a difference to them by adding my mental side to spending more time to ensuring that it's just not financials. But whatever the need is from their end, whether it is some advice I can give or connection I can uh, help them with. So I think active giving and making a difference is much more than just giving a donation or financially helping somebody mm. else. So are you speaking to the hierarchy of needs, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, or is this, you know, what makes Hirsch different than what other people, you know, you achieve this and you achieve that and you go, okay, well, I'm going towards the upper part of the pyramid where I'm here to, you know, give more to others. I mean, what's different about Hirsch Mariwala? I think difference is very open to giving and I don't differentiate between giving. You know, even if I mentor a lot of entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. on an average, I'll be spending at least 10 to 15 hours every month in mentoring. And I get a lot of requests and I'm open to giving advice. Only condition I have is you have to take me seriously. You have ah. to send me a note before you come to meet me. And sure. you have to report to me after some time what has been the impact of that. So I will take it seriously, but I would expect the same thing from your end. Don't just come Absolutely. in. So I think ultimately the catalytic part to me is very, very important. You know, whatever I've done in terms of giving, whether it is from the corporates or from personnel, mm -hmm. how can play a very catalytic role? And it makes a huge difference. This catalysis in terms of combining giving with uh, advice, with mentoring, with uh, any other support they require. To me, that's a very important part of giving and not just donating. Donating is very simple. Yes. 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 But it is active giving, which is spending a lot of time 
on these issues. And I spend about 20, 30% of my time, maybe 30, 40% of my time today in terms of what we call active giving from a corporate point of view, as well as from a personal point of view. Raju, if I look back at my own journey, I find that I get excited by doing something which is pioneering, which hmm. somebody else has not done. And to me, that is would be a big differentiator, whether it's the businesses I built and whatever we have hmm. done in building the businesses we are market leaders in that particular segment. And a lot of it is because hmm. we pioneered that segment. In the same in terms hmm. of giving, we have started three different initiatives, one uh, from Medical Innovation Foundation, which is corporate. Yes which reports to me and we realized that innovation is playing a very, very important role in a corporate journey and more importantly, innovation will play a more important role in the social side in the economy mm -hmm. of the country and that's how we started the Innovation Foundation which the objective of that is to fuel innovation in India and we have many, many initiatives supporting innovators, innovation awards and we just launched a new initiative which is identifying innovators in plastics because we consume mm. a lot of plastics. And as you know, plastics has a negative impact on the environment. Of course. And yes. uh, we have identified 14 innovators. And now we have tied up with a company in Hyderabad, which is that they are going to for recycling plastics. So basically, the challenge is how to collect household waste and put them into high-speed machines, which are AI-enabled. And mm. uh, they sell the plastics and waste. So if that is successful, then we can roll it out all over the country. And, you know, if that can create a huge impact in reducing landfills in big towns and cities. You know? And right. the same thing on the personal side, you know, we started an initiative about 10 years back in the area of mental health. We realized that mm -hmm. mental health was nobody was looking at that subject. The whole subject of mental health has got traction in COVID times. But mm -hmm. we started 10 years back. And today we have a thought leader in the area of mental health in India. And I think globally also, my daughter looks after it. I support it. But we identify together and, you know, as I say, you would need and, and most of us don't realize the impact on good health and on good activity. Absolutely. Go through tension. All of us go through stresses. How do you yeah. overcome? It's just not that you are at a very high end, you just need some counselor. But how do you cope on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of corporate life or in terms of any issue? It could be a relationship or anything else which is causing you stress. And how to cope up with that is a very, very important part because if you're not able to do so, it can have a huge impact on product. And the third thing which I've done is helping entrepreneurs. So I've started Ascent, mm -hmm. which is helping entrepreneurs scale up and learn from each other. So today we have 1,000 entrepreneurs in mm -hmm. India and uh, total cumulative turnover of those 1,000 entrepreneurs is about $10 billion. Wow. And we support them. And I spend a lot of time with them in terms of creating peer-to-peer uh, -peer mm -hmm. learning platforms, seminars, mentoring, and things like that. And sure. in all three of these, we have been pioneers. So we occupied a space which was not occupied by somebody else. We made an early okay. start much, much before anybody else did. In all these three cases, innovation we did about 20 years back. Mental health we did about 10 years back. And even the entrepreneurs thing also as said, we also mm -hmm. done about 10 years. So I think these three are the main causes which I spend a lot of time on. And it gives me tremendous satisfaction, much beyond what I got while building this. Beautiful. So my heart's moving and saying, well, I have so many more questions about that I had not planned to ask you. So maybe, maybe that's another subject. But but I've seen so much about entrepreneurship that you write about and speak about. And of course, I read your book. I was going to say, Harsh, you often say the power of a business is in its purpose. It's on your headline. It is not yes. what we do. Yes. But why we do it that it that defines us. So you're kind of speaking to that. So okay. as I mentioned, my audience is, you know, upwardly mobile. Well, they're successful corporate professionals, but they have decided to to move on and contribute through entrepreneurship and have their own journey. Can you elaborate on your thoughts about what purpose means yes. and how it has influenced your business decisions and your personal yes. life as well? Yes. So almost about 15, 20 years back, we were doing some things which were right. But without planning at a corporate level, we didn't have a purpose statement, but we were doing a lot of things. And then we engaged a consultant. They met a lot of people within the organization and they said that, uh, what is unique about Marico? Can you tell us? And there are a lot of unique things which uh, the consultant identified. And out of those inciting study, they came with a statement to make a difference. So our purpose in Marico and my personal purpose also is to make a difference. Difference to all mm -hmm. the stakeholders, 
many a times, you know, entrepreneurs think that the business is only for the promoters or the owners. But I think increasingly, the corporate research has shown that businesses which look at all the stakeholders, mm-hmm. whether it is promoters or whether it is employees or your society or your customers or the associates you're working with, you have to look at each and every stakeholder and add value to them because all of them are interconnected. If I do something well or something good beyond what is expected out of me for our employees, they will be far more motivated. If they are more motivated, it will reflect into corporate performance. And then all the other stakeholders will benefit. So we have taken some unusual steps in making a difference to all our stakeholders. For example, in the past, we work a lot with advertising agencies. So we have sponsored key people in the ad agencies at our cost to residential training programs. We spend a lot of time in building the culture of the organization where most of the employees enjoy working because I went on hearing, I've never worked anywhere else in my life, but I went on hearing when we recruited people that yes. this company is a lot of politics, this is a lot of gossiping, a lot of backbiting. And I wanted to ensure that, you know, we didn't spend too much time in such negative activity. You know? mm-hmm. So how can you create a culture which is without gossip? which is without backbiting. So we went into a very open culture where we spent a lot of time in ensuring that the organization is open, that one can Mm -hmm. talk to each other on a one-on-one level basis. One doesn't have to go through an organization hierarchy. And even the leaders are chosen based on their leadership style. You would not want a leader who is not operating. So before selecting a leader from outside, if we had to do it, we would put them through a lot of tests in terms of ensuring the leadership style then. Once in a while, even if there's a mistake, then that person has to change. If that person is not able to change, the system will throw that person out because the culture is such that it has to be open. And I think that's really helped the Mm -hmm. the employees enjoy their journey because work is one thing. Your challenge in the work is, of course, very important. But, you know, what is the culture in the organization? Are you enjoying working in the organization? It's a very, very important part of maintaining employees. And I think that's where I'm coming from. Making a difference to each and every stakeholder plays a very, very important. And the same thing with capital. I understand. Yeah. 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 My my question was really more about a purpose. Like I have a personal purpose and the organization has its purpose. It's it's almost impossible to align everybody's purpose. But the question was, what is it that, how do you think of purpose? Because everybody has a purpose. They don't know what it is, but in the moment it's a purpose. How do you think about purpose? And for those that are going to decide to leave yeah. their jobs, etc., because they want to, yes. then looking for their purpose, what should they do? So I think uh, at an individual level, one has to start questioning, what is my purpose? At some stage in life, it starts, the penny drops. Yeah. Maybe when you're young, you don't want to be involved with those issues. But when you are middle age or mid 40 or 50, that's the time when you start questioning, okay, what is the, why am I born? And what are the most two important days in one's life? I'm yes. sure you heard the story. You know, the first is the day you were born. But the second yeah. one, everybody struggles. Yeah. You know, they think that the day I got married, the day I got job. Right. But they don't realize that the purpose, the second most important day in your life is the day you realize why you were born. That's you right. start questioning why were you born and what can you do? It mm. could be anything else. It could be the best father in the world. It could be anything. I don't think you need to have a very large purpose. But yes. you start introspection and questioning, okay, what can I do differently? What Mm -hmm. do I want to be known as? And I think that's Mm -hmm. the journey in terms of searching for purpose comes in. And purpose can change. You may start with something else and you may say, that okay, this is not working out. Let me make some course corrections. So Mm -hmm. ultimately, I like this quote, the purpose of life is a life purpose. Yes. I love that one too. Yes. You have to... uh, you have to look at purpose. That's the one which will give you a lot of satisfaction. Unlike a uh, monetary kind of a <laughs> achievement, which which is to me it doesn't satisfy beyond a point because you know, I mean, what are you going to do with all the money? I'm not. I lead a simple lifestyle <laughs> compared to yes. I don't need to own planes, or I don't need beyond a mm-hmm. certain size of the house, a very big yeah. house. But that's my belief. Or it could differ with. Yeah. Well, having known you for some time and interact with you, I know that humility is a big hallmark of yours. So I totally want to convey to my audience that this is true. This man lives that way. So don't think of some, you know, money as your only purpose. There's other stuff that you need to find your purpose. 
All right, so I'm going to go to your book for a minute because I really enjoy reading several chapters of your book called, for those listening, the book is called Harsh Realities or Harsh Realities. <laughs> in that case, maybe. But it's a story of Mariko, but of course, it's through the eyes and, you know, heart of Harsh here. So the kind of growth that you have experienced in the context of India that has to come from a deeper level of mastery, Harsh, obviously. And since my focus is on becoming more bold in life while being conscious, can you describe two or three, maybe one or two pivotal moments in your entrepreneurial journey? And there are many in the book, so I, I know that. But for those who haven't read the book, you clear your bold decisions. Two or three, maybe. Correct? Okay. Yeah, please. Okay, I started two. working at a very young age, at the age of 20. And I'm just a commerce graduate. I have not studied anything further, unlike Raju, you and many others who may be uh, listening to the podcast. So it's a commerce graduate, but it's okay. So, well, that's a charter uh, accountant, but that's okay. Yeah. yeah so, so you've done postgraduate. I'm not sorry, postgraduate. I wanted to <laughs> go to my MBA. I couldn't get in. An average student. My father didn't allow me to go abroad. He was very scared that I'll never come back. So I joined the family <laughs> organization at that time, a typically family managed organization in the heart of commodity markets. It was completely family managed. There were no professionals. And I was there to go then. In that exploration study, I identified consumer products as a growth opportunity because we were already doing something on a very, very small scale. And I said, if we can build that business, it will become far more profitable. It will be mm -hmm. far more sustainable in terms of growth. The way I am built as an individual, I don't like to use influence. That's my belief. I don't like to go and pamper somebody else to get the favor done. Mm -hmm. So from what we wrote, those days in India, it was a lot of what, what was known as license raj where you had to go to Delhi to get a license. And if you got a license, because everything was licensed, all the industries, then you were made in terms of the business. From my family, friends, their children, they were spending a lot of time in Delhi and I just couldn't do it. I was just not cut out for that. Nor was I cut out to work with B2B businesses where you had to take out buyers for dinners. You mm. had to be in business also. But that just didn't work with me. And when I realized that I could set up a business in consumer products. I had to deal with distributors who were very yes. easy to do. And that whole sector of the license. So it beautifully fitted in with my personality, which at that time was far more introvertish and simple. And I thrived on that. And you know, it, I'm not a tech person. So from that point of view, also concentrating on distribution, marketing, I think it just to the right fit. I think many, mm -hmm. many times entrepreneurs you have to find the right fit depending on your strengths, what kind of business you want to get into. Because if somebody else just is thriving in a business which you're, which is not your strength, then you're yeah. not succeeding because you're not enjoying. But if it right. is your strength and you're enjoying that passion, then you are enjoying the journey of entrepreneurship. And I think it's important to enjoy that journey. So the business mm. started and then over a period of time <laughs> built up much, much larger and you know. At some stage in my own journey, I realized that if I had to succeed in consumer products, I needed to spin it off in a different company because there were like seven, eight family members in the company which I had built up and it was dual reporting, was not able to attract talent. There was no system of allocation of resources amongst different businesses. And uh, by then the business I had built was the largest in terms of size of the, the main holding company. So I had to convince others that can I spin it off in another company? I don't want to increase my ownership stake. It is the same just because I picked up, I am not entitled to get a higher share. Mm. But can I get the freedom to operate on my own? It took three years, Raj. And, you know, mm. But to me, those three years were the most well spent three years. Because in a family managed company, consensus is very, very important. If you're not able to drive this, then you'll be fighting all your life. So I spent years building consensus and driving this decision. And if I look back, this has been the most important decision in my life in terms of business. Because it just feed me up in terms of handling our family issues, attracting resources, allocation of capital. And this, I was able to predict what I could do. And I was in charge of whatever resources later I could invest in profits, unlike in the past, which was not in my Mm -hmm. So that a lot of freedom, and that's how we take the right culture for the organization, the business grew over mm -hmm. a period of time. Got six of my 12 uncles, 
the account that forced me to go public. So I would say that starting Marico was the most important turning point for me. Mm. Second point I want to make was when I bought over the stage for my cousin, you know, I had to pay them money and uh, it was within a certain short time frame and you are not able to go public. Right. I had in that time. So for two years, I was borrowed at a very, very high interest cost of 18 to 24 percent in person. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that I went through a lot of stress. Ultimately, we went public. We said we mm -hmm. have to go public come what may. And then the life has been very different after you are listed company because then you are sure. different sets of issues, whether it's quarterly mm -hmm. profits or meeting investors or governance or things like that, you know, or yeah. a board of directors. But looking back, going public has been positive. It is a means mm -hmm. to an end. Right. I didn't want to go. It's a means mm -hmm. to an end. I mean, if you require right. money, we, we had to go public because there's another option. In those days, mm. private equity years were very, very few. We tried working with Goldman Sachs, right. and work but this is a means to an end. I mean, you may go public if you need more resources, but don't say I just want to go public for the sake of going public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Days when I stepped down, you know, yeah, I stepped yeah. down at the age of sixty-three. I was not trying to step down, but uh, the current MD who's been with us for the last ten years, he came mm. to me. He was with us prior to that for about 10 years saying that, you know, in India, it's a very hierarchical society and it is yes. expected that yes. your children will, will follow you in terms of leadership role if you're a family owned company. And he came to me saying that, okay, I'm just asking you, I am very ambitious. I like working for Maripo, but I mean, is there any chance of me to head the company? If it is not, then I will start searching. Okay. The open ended right. discussion led me to a lot of soul searching and discussion with the board. And then we said it's good to the interest of the company that I should step down. I was not ready to step down, but stepping down is a big, big step, you know, because mm. you know, when you actively involved, is what do you do with your time? And my wife was very clear that you're not going to sit at home. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't go on playing golf all the time, you know, Raju, you have to be yeah, very yeah. clear. You know. Of course. So that has given me a completely, I've reinvented myself in terms of doing a lot of things which I never imagined I could do. Yeah. But I think every yeah. stage in an entrepreneur's journey, you have to be different. When you were when I was very small, you're doing things on your own. And when mm. you become middle size, you're getting things done from others, which means completely yes. different all game in terms of team building processes. And when you're large, you're influencing others. Nobody may be reporting to you, but your job is to influence them through writing, through speaking and things like that. Yes. yes. You just uh, begun to answer the next question I had released on your book because I read so much about the complexity. And of course, I know this from the outside, but when you share your story, like India is known for its cultural family ties and family-run businesses. So how do you see the trend evolving? I mean, you said that the younger generation either wants to be independent of the family business or they want to integrate professional roles into family-run businesses. And you've already touched on how you've allowed and in a sense made some very difficult choices and decisions because, you know, how do you manage the balance between professional management and family involvement, you know, in Marico, it's got to be. So I think yes. you sort of touched on that and that freedom that you didn't think you had to do other things are, you know, are coming through because you have a professional. But do you see that trend continuing or do you, I mean, you write a lot about, about this issue. Yeah. I know succession planning, etc. So, Where do you see the trend? Yeah. I think two sets of issues I would like to say. One is the, in terms of entrepreneurship in India, you know, one trend we've seen in the recent last five or 10 years is that new entrepreneurs are springing up from non-business families, which is a very positive thing. And especially mm. technology is enabled that technology compared combined with the uh, availability of financial resources because of um, mm -hmm. so many people wanting to fund a good business idea. So, yep. and coming from very small towns also, you know, so earlier it used to yep. be Bombay, but now you see businesses coming in from, sprouting from, and the whole ecosystem for entrepreneurship is growing. We still have a lot of scope. But India can only achieve a $5 trillion economy. We, th entrepreneurs thrive. Yes. Uh, ultimately, you can't expect the government to do everything else. Ultimately, entrepreneurs will have sure. to create wealth in the country. Right. So that's mm -hmm. the broad background. Now, coming specifically to your question about how is the trend amongst Indian business families? 
in terms of delegating, in terms of giving the rope to the professionals. I think yes. as the business is becoming more complex and all businesses are getting complex with yes. the invasion of all the technologies coming in and not one but all whole set of technology. I think mm-hmm. businesses are getting more complex. And if they don't change, there's a threat that many of the businesses will be wiped out. So I think mm-hmm. that's forcing many managements and many owners to to bring in change. But if you ask me, are they successful? Some of them, of course, are, but many of them are mm-hmm. still struggling. Because they are mm-hmm. not able to relinquish their control over the business. If you mm-hmm. select a good professional and if you're happy with that professional's capability, then you have to let go. You can't control everything. That control mindset is very, very hard. So mm. things are changing, but uh, we still have a long way to go. In mm. terms of the succession, in terms of involvement of family and businesses, I think yes. there are very few businesses who are completely professionals. I think you may be one of the first ones in India. There have been mm. some where many large family members were involved in the business. And mm. because there was a difference of opinion who managed that business, they were forced to go professional. So, oh. companies like Asian Paints, Dabur, PD Light, mm. circumstances forced them to, to select an outside CEO. In mm. my case, what happened was I was the only person in the company, managing the company. Mm. So, I mean, we didn't have that kind of conflict within the family. Mm-hmm. But in spite of that, we made that uh, decision and it's worked out well. Mm. Raju, the kind of market cap increase which has gone in the last 10 years is huge. Mm. And yeah, of course. It's a win-win. I have enjoyed that part of the journey. I mean, what? Mm. Uh, but as I said, it's hands off and mind on 24 by 7. Right. Okay. So not to digress too much on this subject because I'm interested in it as well. Are there two things or three things you can tell other family owned businesses in India of what they should consider? Maybe three factors or three things that you found to be most important for them to consider? I think first of all, most family business or promoters, they think that they know it all. They're their yes. best man. I don't think that is right. You know, you always you have to search harder for getting somebody who will be better than you. Because mm-hmm. you just don't assume that you are the best. Yes. Number two, there's a fear that okay, we are owners, others are professionals. But how can you instill ownership mindset in professionals and other things? And it is possible, Raju, you know, yes. to instill ownership mindset by empowering them, by creating uh, wealth mechanisms for them. Yes. Is taking. So I think it's important that you owners should behave like professionals and the professionals should behave like owners, you know. I love it. I love it. Awesome. So I think that's another challenge amongst India in terms of making that mm-hmm. shift in, in professionalizing the company. And while doing so, of course, don't don't abdicate your responsibilities. I mean, if you select a new professional, sure. yeah. you delegate you in the initial phases, you have a little bit more in closer interaction. But at some mm-hmm. stage when that you are confident about that person, then you delegate more and more. But yeah. that doesn't mean yeah. that you're not res- you are responsible for that person, whatever that person do, then you're not abdicating your responsibilities. Got it. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. So this may sound like a repetitive question, but it isn't. So if you had to redefine success on your terms, Harsh, what would you have done differently from what you've already achieved? Obviously, those decisions you made had a fruit later on. Uh, the point I'm uh, trying to get at is turning points and challenges often shape our lives, right? Significantly, yes. because it's always that trauma or that situation that was at the time seemed unconscionable, insurmountable, but you overcame. So maybe there are one or two memorable stories from your journey that might inspire listeners who are on the verge of transitioning from corporate roles to entrepreneurship. So I think overall, I don't have big regrets. Okay. Uh, if I you ask me to Say something, I would say sometimes when you take some shortcuts, it impacts you, you know. Shortcuts in terms of processes, shortcuts in terms of selecting talent. Many times, you know, because it is business pressure, you tend to select talent. And uh, you don't do proper homework in terms of references or interviewing or whatever else. And it's a wrong decision. That wrong decision can put you back by a few years now. Mm. Because you recruit a person, you are equally responsible to ensure that the person succeeds. And you don't want to... Even if you get early signal that it's not working out, you want to give that person a try. Yeah. And that itself may take one, two years, and then by the time you recruit somebody else, so then mm. especially at senior leadership levels, you know, 
that time wasted is it can have a big impact on your growth journey. Mm-hmm. So I would say mm-hmm. that especially people who make decisions, you have to do it uh, very deliberating and uh, with a lot of inquiry. And one other rule we have: when in doubt, out. You know? So if you are doubtful, <laughs> yes. the person, it's better to out that person rather yes. than still the person. You know? As they say, hire slowly but fire fast. Right. Yeah. That's another way to do it. Yeah. 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 So um, I'm going to switch gears again a little bit because everything I do has to do with being bold and conscious. I'll describe bold. I mean, in my book, I describe bold as having these five elements, ambitious, decisive, right. totally convinced or convicted of your beliefs yeah. and what you want to do. Humble, which is, I added the definition, and then heart-led. You're designed to lead with your heart, not with your head. So those yes. are, that's how I define it. What does bold yeah. mean to you and how have you embodied whatever your elements are in your life and your business life too, your life too? So I think I agree with whatever you mentioned in your book, uh, whatever you covered, I fully agree with all that. But if I look back at my own journey, you know, I think you have to start questioning, particularly the definition of bold in terms of whatever you're doing, you know, and I'll give an example of, so you have to be contrary, not do what others are doing. I'm not saying for the sake of being contrary and do it, but don't be mm. scared of something. You know? mm. And I'll give you one or two examples. Uh, one example sure. I'll give you a factory we had to set up in uh, for coconut oil. And uh, the best location from a financial point of view was mm. North India and Kerala. But that state had a lot of industry relations problem. And all my friends, family said that you'll make the biggest mistake of your life if you set up a factory in Kerala. But financially, it made huge sense if that factory was successful. And we took that as a challenge. We said that why industry relations are bad in that, that state. You know? mm. Can we tackle that? And we realized that our insight was that, you know, most of the workers in that state during the day they worked and then in the evening they didn't have anything else to do. So mm. while you the time, trade union activities, negativity. So we said, can we treat them fairly and keep them fully busy in other activities, whether it's sports or art or culture or drama or whatever, or right. music, and create that kind of lifestyle which uh, satisfied them. And that went up very well in the state and we didn't have any problem in terms of industry relations and that contrary decision had a huge impact on our profits, positive, mm. which if I listen mm. to others, I would have also. Right. So we were doing this. Mm. I'll give one more example in recent time. Sure, so, please. You know, our sector which is fast moving consumer goods the package consumer goods has got disrupted uh, it was the most defensive sector about five years back amongst all the sectors one of the most defensive sectors and we have seen that the emergence of need to see players direct to consumer players players who were not able to launch products because of huge advertising budgets needed to launch products or huge distribution infrastructure needed especially in the country like india they were able to do so because of digital marketing, because of digital mm-hmm. marketplaces, e-marketplaces, and we saw an emergence of so many B2C brands impacting growth of FMCG businesses. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, one way to look at this emergence of these brands as threats, that, okay, you how do you protect your current business from these brands? Another is to flip around and say, can I look at it from an opportunistic point of view? So can you create your own D2C brands? Can you acquire D2C brands? So we acquired four D2C brands. We also have a with D2C brands. But they have to be managed very differently. You can't mm-hmm. manage the traditional FMCG business like a D2C. So it's, it's manned by a very young team at a different corporate location because we would not want our culture and our abundance in our big brand business to go to them. And mm-hmm. I think that's well, we are, we are on a way to creating scale and profitability in the D2C business. But we looked at it from a point of view, an opportunity rather than threat. And we are the, I think one of the only companies who has done it differently in FMCG in India. So you're talking about embracing so, disruption in a way where you, you start yes. owning it. Yes. Yeah, because the world is changing so fast. And you know, I think yes. you have to think differently. So yeah. being a contrary and ultimately on the social side also, then making a difference. You know? Yes talked about yes. creating yes. and all. To me, all that is important. But if I look at our own journey, you know, whenever we pioneered something I mentioned earlier, or whenever yes. we've innovated in some areas, 
we so they had a discontinuous impact on our business and we've done many many innovations mm -hmm. which have been successful many innovations which have failed also because innovation is has a lot of failure sure. and many organizations are not willing to take a risk there is a fear of failure but sure. if that fear of failure is there in the organization innovation will not happen because sometimes you win and this is sometimes you lose but no sometimes you win but you always learn benefit yes sometimes you win sometimes you learn That's the yeah difference. so you i was going to speak to the uh, the thing about failures you touched on it already so how should anybody look at you know i'm, I'm about to quit my job and i know i want to do this i may not know exactly what but how do i prevent failure right because most people don't leave want to let go of their lifestyle or their income or status whatever they have in their jobs so what are the top three core life lessons that you could share with them to say so i i reckon you are referring to individuals who quit a job and want to start a business is that the core yes. so that's my largely my audience that yes. that's you know they've been at it like in, you were saying in their late 30s early 40s maybe that's where the journey begins start questioning yeah. existential yeah. questions and they know this is not for them this rat race okay. or whatever they're climbing they've got to the top of the ladder but then that's not yeah. they're still unsatisfied so actually there are three stages in an entrepreneur's journey first stage is to identify what is unique you're bringing to the table mm -hmm. it's a highly competitive world and if you offer a me to product or a service then your yes. chances of success will not be that you have to offer something which is differentiated mm -hmm. and so that idea you have to start work you know okay, what is the right to win i can create normally it's not an idea but then one has to discuss that idea with other stakeholders whoever you are you respect or some of the colleagues ultimately that has to be talked to the potential customers what do yes. you feel about it there is enough potential mm -hmm. the first phase is to ideation what is the idea does it have legs in terms of traction can it be scaled up is it differentiated will it interest consumers and mm -hmm. that ideation when combined with discussion with other colleagues or with the customers will undergo change you may have something mm -hmm. beginning but by the time you do all those insighting it will take a different shape and yes. at that time you say okay i have an idea which i think is worth getting into and then you start planning for resources mm -hmm. and one way as you know there is as the bible put it me and the is that failure element all this may not succeed so my recommendation would be to reduce your risk by what we call prototyping so there mm -hmm. are limitations to market research you can do market research and and launch a product but all the answers will not come out of market research the only mm -hmm. way to test whether your hypothesis is working is to prototype it so mm -hmm. you put in a in one town or a part of a town or if you are a new product in a retail chain and you're testing various things if you're a new product company you're testing the branding you're testing packaging you're testing pricing you're testing the formulation you're testing how the consumer is buying it and in the product phase which reduces your risk dramatically because you're doing a very small scale it's a live mm -hmm. market research okay. and you define action standards before you prototype that okay if i achieve these action standards i will scale it up and you because it's live market research something is going wrong you should be adaptable to change that we mm. whether it's surprising or market support or promotion or something yeah. so the only way to reduce the risk is to prototype on a small scale and then once you it is working you are achieving your action standard then scale it up you may scale mm. it up in phases also depending on your resources availability and the scope that the business has but i think that's the only way ultimately i think you should not have fear of failing and yes. sometimes it may fail also but you know if your resources are capped at a small scale because of prototyping then you may not have a big impact financially if it doesn't succeed well i wish you were around when i was starting my first business 20 years ago or i could come to you and talk about this but i didn't so as the business um, succeed i would say two other things raju you know i think don't yeah. underestimate the importance of talent and culture you know you have to attract talent you have to create yes. the right culture to retain employees and mm -hmm. don't take shortcuts on the owners you know i have seen many businesses Absolutely. especially in india they take such shortcuts but you can't say i am small so i am taking a shortcut because yeah, then you exactly. see people are taking shortcuts within the organization when you grow up and that will haunt you at some stage in future 
you know, one of my mentors says, how you do one thing is how you do everything. So if your yeah. DNA is to take shortcuts at small yeah. level, you'll do it again yeah. in the future. Absolutely. And then Absolutely. you're sowing yeah. the seeds of that taking shortcuts down. Exactly. Line. In your company, <laughs> in your organization. Okay, so uh, we didn't touch on consciousness. So let's talk about that for a minute. And maybe we, before we get to quick rapid fire questions, which I What's warned you I will do. Consciousness to me, as I say in my book, it's a question of, you know, it's an awareness. So you could say life is happening to me. That's what we call the victim mentality. You know, I'm just, you know, I do all these things and life, life is happening to me. It's I'm just a victim. Number two is life, life is happening by me. I'm in charge. I can make anything happen. I'm in I'm control. And the third level is life is happening either for me or through me. You can guess there's no right answer. It's just like these are levels of consciousness. Yeah. So in order to practice that you're making decisions, because I tend to attract people who are conscious, more conscious, but they're not as bold. So bold we touched on. But consciousness is one of those things that, you know, they're very humble. They want to do good for others and they want to create something. What does consciousness mean to you again? And are there practices that you, including in your personal life, because ultimately where you are, Harsh, and what you built, cannot come without sacrifices at home or other parts of your life, friendships, etc., and things you want to do, but I can't, you can't because you're, sometimes business is your focus. So I would say, first of all, one has to be aware of what one's strengths are. And many mm -hmm. of us don't know our own strengths. You know, I have a very strong belief in strengths-based approach to life. You know? Many of us don't know what our strengths are, and always my suggestion is, please identify your strengths. I talk to individuals who know you well, your family, your friends, whoever knows you well. And if I stand, mold your life on your strengths rather than trying to improve weakness. Only if there are fatal flaws. Now, if there are fatal flaws, of course, you have to improve. But to buy in life. Can you give an example of that? Like what, what would be a weakness or something that you. For example, I'm not good at technology. So I cannot get into a business which is technology. -led. I can't get into mentoring somebody on a subject which I don't know because it is everybody else is doing it you know got it so i'm just giving an example but you know you yep. have to either make your life to leverage your strengths whether in business mm -hmm. or whether in giving or to me that's a very very important part of conscious life you know? and mm -hmm. then you have to go on trying you know you will ultimately everything is not in your hands when you're living life so you mm -hmm. have to depending on how life pans out you know there are certain things which are beyond your control you have to realize okay is something I can't do, so I, let me accept it. Let me mm. make the best out of it rather than fighting that thing which has happened mm. because of circumstances, because of destiny, sure. you know. And you've yeah. gone through, I know you've gone through some personal issues, you know, in terms sure, of your sure. life. But, you know, it's you have to accept that. You, know, you have to live that. And then you have to sure. always be full of for what you have rather than missing out on what you yes, have. You know? exactly. To me, that's very, very important part. You have to be happy, you have to be very grateful. And what can you do based on your strengths which will make a difference to others? To me, that's how I would sum, okay. sum up whatever you may call it, consciousness or living life. Yes. But uh, yeah. ultimately, you, I think you're living life for a purpose. Mm -hmm. So are there practices you follow, like maybe in the morning, evening, daytime, that keep you so, centered? Yeah, I mean, I'm very, very much into health. And uh, I strongly believe that health plays a very important role in a person's journey. Of course. So I, I do, I spend one and a half to two hours every day on health, different, different awesome. things. Awesome. Because you, we have to go on different, doing different, otherwise it's very boring, you know, whether it is yes. Pilates or yoga or aqua therapy or, or weights or functional training or golf. So mm -hmm. I think there has to be a variety in whatever you're doing. You know. mm -hmm. And then of course, I have started lately, I started some breathing thing, you know, I, so there are some virtual breathing exercises. Mm -hmm. Because breathing, they say, is good. Start yoga sure. and uh, I start doing meditation. I wish I could. I'm not as regular and all that as I should mm -hmm. be. But I think all that is good for the mind. You have mm -hmm. to be ultimately happy in terms of and contented. And yes. everybody goes through stresses. So how do you meet those stresses? There's not a single mm -hmm. person who is not at failure in life. There is not a single person in the world who is not at stress in life. So of how course. do you cope? The coping of mechanisms are very, very important. Yes. Failures. Yes. If you have that right kind of approach to life, you'll be able to go up. And preventive is very important. To me, I have to lead a lifestyle 
which is preventive. A lot of people complain of, say, knee problems or, you know. Yes. Ultimately, it is wrong lifestyle you're leading or diabetes or heart. And yes. if you have the right diet, if you have the right uh, exercises, if you mentally doing the right things, a lot of diseases of today could be completely avoided. And these diseases have come in the recent past, maybe. 20, 30 years or 50 years. Now. Yes, yes. So a lot of people complain of knee surgery and this surgery. I say, if you are active and by and large, you will not need such surgeries in life. That's a man after my heart because that's what I believe. So, <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm a few years behind you, but but I believe in that. Are you ready for some rapid fire? A few words here and there. We just go very quickly. Sure. Good. Go. Yeah. All right. Get ready, guys. If you're still watching or listening. Influential book. What is the one book that has had a profound impact on you and why? Wish I, I could name one, but the author like <laughs> Ram Charo, my own, Valdebu is my co-author. I have written many books, uh, that's business books. And uh -huh. then the book on grit, you know, which grit is a combination of determination and passion, you know. Yes. Because many times we are passionate, but we are not determined to give up that passion. So grit is the right word if you want to succeed in life. So there's a book okay, on grit. Great, yeah. guys. Uh, who has been the biggest inspiration in your life and what did you learn from them? At one level, the most admired person for me is Gandhiji, who was father of our nation. I mean, you're underestimating what he did in mm. terms of his approach, in terms of getting the freedom struggle. Yeah. I would rate him as, though I never met, the, met him, but still. Of course. Yeah. He's a father yeah. figure of many of us. Okay. <laughs> what is the one habit or routine that you believe has significantly contributed to your success? One. Discipline and structure. Structure, okay. I'm very structured in terms of, I, I have to do a lot of things in a day and I have to achieve them, you know. So I have a daily yes. sheet, which is, people think they're, I'm very structured, but unless I was structured and the discipline, I would not be able to do so many things in my life. So I think it has me achieve whatever I want to achieve. Okay. Dream dinner guest. Three, yes. name three people living or d dead you would want at dinner or have dinner with, and who would they be and why? So one is, of course, uh, would be Gandhiji. Mm -hmm. Other would be, I, I love playing golf, so Tiger Woods. <laughs> and uh, Raju, I play golf with you also. But yes. I think how no, 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 you want play. Tiger Woods, you don't want me. <laughs> <laughs> and third? And the third is, I think uh, on innovation, I would stay Steve Jobs. Oh. Because what, yeah. Beautiful, yep. Okay. Right. The best piece of advice that you have ever received and how it has influenced or changed you? I think when we had a pressure from a competitor, advice given to me was protect your resource generating engine. And I think that was given by Ram I'll mm. let you a detailed context, but we don't have the time No, that's to okay. Do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's fine. What advice would you give to your younger self if you were able to go back in time? No, pretty much the life I've stayed. I mean, you shouldn't take some of the shortcuts you had taken in the life. Uh -huh. and otherwise, okay. leverage your strengths, be ambitious, yeah. be confident, be a maverick. All right. What is a common myth about entrepreneurship that you can debunk? You don't have to work as much as people think that entrepreneurship means that you have to speak all your life. Now, ultimately, you can, and I have never worked that much. In, I recruit very mm -hmm. good talent. And, you know, you will, people think that you have to work 24 by 7 while well building business. I don't agree with that. Okay. What is your go to productivity hack that helps you stay efficient and focused? I think you kind of touched on it, but yeah. No, I think very disciplined focus. Uh, focus mm -hmm. is very, very important. You do a yep. few things, okay. but do okay. What is your favorite activity or hobby that helps you relax and unwind? So I would say golf. Though mm -hmm. I wish I'd, I was a better golfer. <laughs> I That's like okay. listening to Indian classical music and I exercise a lot. Great. All right, last question on this. What is one achievement that you're most proud of that other people might surprise, be surprised to hear about? Ultimately, you have to be building the company which uh, has got very good respect, got very mm -hmm. good. So my building of Merrick was something which I would say I'm most proud of. Is there something that you'd like to tell the audience before we close? And I have one last question before you go, but just go ahead and see if there's anything that comes to mind that, that we you probably should have said? No, I think to lead a good life, you have to enjoy your journey. You have to leverage your strengths. You have to be grateful for what you have rather than what you don't have. 
I mean, all of us go through stresses and all that. It's a part and parcel of life. Mm-hmm. Take it as mm-hmm. it comes. Then learn how to cope up with such challenges and make the best out of them. Money is the least thing, important thing in life. Once you have a certain basic standard in life, it does not matter. Money. I think we have to aspire for other things which satisfy you, which bring you happiness. Beautiful. Beautiful. So I was going to say, I don't take anything for granted. So I really appreciate you taking the time and agreeing to be on this show. Harsh, so thank you for that. So in that same vein of gratitude that I'm really gr- grateful for this, what any discoveries, if any, that you might have had in this conversation we've had the last maybe 45 minutes? No, I think it covered uh, beautifully the almost in-depth issues to do with life rather than business. So mm. business in context of life is something which uh, you covered beautifully, you know, and very mm. uh, beautifully interwoven life with business you know, because it is just mm. not building a business. Business is very rational, but how do you combine that with the purpose in life? Is something which was captured and beautifully integrated in this uh, last one hour. Oh, well, that's heartening to hear. And I hope that, that you found something useful, as you say. And I really appreciate you saying that. And uh, those guys still with us, listening or watching, I'm sure you probably want to watch this again or listen to it again and take some notes because there's some gems here. There are so many nuggets here that, you know, you might think that... Uh, Oh, well, you know, these are all things that, you know, people talk about. But no, it's true. I know this man lives it. So uh, go pay attention and listen to it again. Thank you, Harsh. Really delighted that you you could come. Thank you. And all the best to you.